Thank you very much, sir. And uh, the room is yours, and you can just start your session, sir. Imran, sir? <clears throat> yes, I thank you very much. I'm just thank trying you. to, all of a sudden, there's an issue with the sharing. I'm trying to work. OK, it. OK, 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 sir. So I hope you're able to see my screen. Sure. OK, perfect. OK, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to really appreciate and thank uh, all the uh, organizers who uh, have this uh, such a comprehensive uh, plan uh, over the whole week that I've seen. I have been, uh, I was mostly around on Monday, but uh, other days given it was a heavy pack load work for me, myself. Uh, I was trying to be in and out. So basically, I have to again thank all the organizers for inviting me for the session and uh, what a lovely program it has been. And I think it's very beneficial for not only for the speakers, uh, you know, it's kind of a very good revival, but also who are already listening as audience, I'm sure they are benefiting hugely from this. So uh, in the next hour uh, and a half or so, or maybe a little less, uh, we are going to look into uh, some probably little trivial but not necessarily very uh, clear in our mindsets the way we'd want to go ahead with uh, our pathway to research carriers uh, and what is the successful way uh, to do the same so again in this aspect I'm going to look at my uh, personal experience as well along when I'm presenting a few tips uh, in here and uh, in this workshop or in this kind of presentation, uh, it's very, very helpful if uh, we establish a two-way type of communication. So uh, yes, I can keep talking, but that's not the whole objective. Obviously, it'll be very nice. Uh, you, are, you can uh, unmute, and I hope that that is an option to unmute and just stop me at any point. And I think that will make the conversations uh, more applicable, uh, or let's say more of a learning in a two-way street for all of us. So I have given this workshop twice before. Uh, both the times it ran uh, over an hour in, 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 on an average, uh, or let's say 60% of time me speaking and uh, another 40 minutes, 45 minutes of uh, Q&As uh, usually. So uh, hopefully we can have such type of uh, you know uh, discussion and, and, and you know learning for both of from my side and from the audience side today as well. So. Uh, Again, myself, I am, uh, as already been shared, I am an assistant professor in University of Glasgow uh, in UK. I teach mostly around wireless communications, and that's my expertise in research aspect as well. And in our small research group over here, we work around wireless, within the domain of wireless communications, where we look into issues such as, uh, or let's say we want to look in, uh, into spectral efficiency and uh, basically uh, security efficiency of our wireless systems as they move uh, in beyond 5G and towards 6G. Uh, and we look into these uh, aspects uh, and we try to employ uh, free space optical technology as well within, these, uh, within this domain. So I also mentioned over here that I have, uh, I'm have i a past chair of IET and Professionals Committee, which is Institution of Engineering and Technology. It's a global committee. And one of the reasons I mentioned here is because uh, last year, let's February 2020, just before the lockdown happened, we were in India, uh, actually in Bangalore, where we had a huge global event. Uh, all, we had huge participation of young professionals, early careers, PhDs uh, from within India and even beyond. So that event was very, very successful. And just after that, we, we hit a lockdown. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, one of the reasons why I mentioned this, because it had a link uh, with uh, you know uh, our kind of talk that we're going to do today, towards the end especially. So uh, you have already, uh, we have been very generous to see my background uh, in this uh, early five minutes. So I'm not going to go into this repetition over here. It's exactly the same thing that we have seen. But I'm going to start our journey of discussion from masters onwards. I do assume most of uh, us over here in the audience uh, have, uh, you know, we all are undergraduates, uh, uh, at least. 
Uh, even if not, then at least this presentation will still give us some hint. But I'm assuming we all are masters and above level, and we are looking at how to uh, you know, uh, pave our pathway uh, into research uh, directions, be it you want to go uh, as a PhD or you have already done PhD, you want to go into a postdoc. Even if you have done a postdoc, you purely want to focus as a, a faculty member. A faculty member could be focusing, uh, besides teaching, on the research uh, intellectual part. But there's also an equal chance that a faculty also wants to spend time uh, in <coughs> research in the pedagogical direction. And that is also known as <coughs> the scholarship uh, in teaching, in learning and teaching. So this is something, again, the reason why I'm explicitly mentioned this, because this is something that is taking up um, a huge, you know, uh, leap into our academic, uh, you know, domain. And I personally have seen uh, this or learned, let's say, this part very recently uh, since I have uh, joined uh, UK uh, institution. And I myself have, has de have delved in, inside this part and seen uh, quite a good potential out there uh, to, to explore. So let me come back to our masters, you know. So when we when we go for our master's education, uh, again, this all discussions irrelevant of where we are doing it. Obviously, they, it has some sense to always look where, where we want to go for these degrees or where we want to go for our education, uh, for the education. But let's talk about this from a solely technical perspective. So when we talk about master's degree, it's kind of a niche or let's say a very small uh, edge uh, expertise that we are trying to gain over our generic type of education that we have uh, obtained uh, all throughout our undergraduate uh, learning. So as a master's, many people look at it as a pathway to simply pick up an edge uh, of uh, you know, expertise or specialization and quickly jump into industry and set up their careers. Uh, and that is a very, very fair move. Uh, and within the industrial life, uh, Again, this kind of uh, a master's degree might not allow or might not provide a lot of opportunities from research uh, or you know R and D perspective. But yes, they do establish a career and they're able to uh, be successful with this edge of having a master's degree. But again, uh, when we go into masters, this is what we have to define early on. So we want to define our career target. You know, do do I really want to go into the industry right away and you know just uh, focus on my career over there and not come back to education, or I, I do want to come back to education. Uh, so if and there are many at times, and maybe many of you who have or uh, students who you supervise, you might realize that this is a big source of confusion for many students even today. Uh, and what I try to tell or what I try to suggest is. Basically, if that if that is the level of confusion that one is not sure what they want to do next, again, it all depends on the opportunities, the economy, and everything. Uh, they all play a major major role. So, and it's it's a fair confusion. There's no harm in that. Uh, so, it's always good to keep our masters uh, in such a way that it is uh, uh, applicable to continuing PhDs. What I mean by that is. Many a times there are master's options that are basically uh, that that are basically purely based on uh, coursework and examinations, or maybe small projects, and that get completed within a year or maximum two years of time frame. Uh, but if we opt for thesis option, usually again I'm using terminology that I'm aware of. Uh, so thesis option allows you to go into uh, six to twelve months of research activity. Now, this research activity might not necessarily be, be something novel or something new in that area uh, of, uh, you know, uh, or let's say that topic, but it does give a sense of uh, what will go into research when they, if, 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 and if they, uh, you know, pursue a career into research direction. Now, that allows them basically to reformulate or reproduce some existing publication or existing research outcome uh, in that short time frame. I myself have done that more than a decade ago. I have many students who have been doing this with me. We try to uh, mentor them by picking up a very, very simple 
project or a very simple topic, uh, maybe a, 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 re a recent research publication or something of that sort, and they pick that up uh, and they try to learn through the theory, they try to learn through the basics and come up with the anal analysis themselves, try to go and learn the simulation environment, try to reproduce that environment into simulation, uh, and so on. So this journey of purely six to 12 months of focusing on a small reformulation of a research problem or re reproducing those results gives them the chance uh, or the flavor of what they can expect on a larger scale when they go for a PhD and beyond. So that is the kind of thing they, they should always define when at the master's level to make sure if they're, if they're confused, then at least they go with this option. They don't lose much time but they gain a lot of basic foundation that will really help them to continue in research direction, even if they decide to come back much later on. But at least having this foundation will help them to you know, have that basic behind their minds. So to do that, again, the part of identifying a proper personnel or proper faculty member to supervise them for even that short duration is very, very challenging these days because Today, it, it becomes, uh, because investing into master's students is a very, very uh, small, uh, let's say, target. And the supervisors do not see much beneficial, a benefit in that because there's probably not, ex they're not expecting any publication coming out of that. So what happens is now, assuming that we have our master's and they're going into a PhD level, we always want to define our career now. So by when, you, when you're entering a PhD, it is a point where you're giving or you are basically making a contractual agreement or you are basically putting yourself into a bond of four years at least. It is a huge time of your life. It is also one of the primary time periods of your life, you know. So we don't want to get this you know, let's say not so beneficial, and we do not want to regret after these four years, oh, what have I done? And usually it requires a lot of stamina, uh, a mental stamina to go ahead. Yes, intellectual property is very important, but having that is not enough because I personally have seen there uh, many of my PhD uh, colleagues, or let's say friends who started PhD together, they were really much better than me, uh, they, they were very strong, but they did not have that stamina. They themselves claimed it, and they left PhD within the first or second year, actually. They left off. They, they found some better options, and they are very successful, successful in their careers today. But it took them that, that while to realize that PhD is not only about being intellectually strong, but it also re requires a lot of stamina uh, to, to stay there, to stay there with the failures, because within PhD, there's a lot of failures that you will face in terms of topic identification, uh, in terms of uh, finding theory to solve that problem, in terms of the simulation environments, setting them uh, those up. And if you're doing experimental kind of PhD, then the experimental setup is in itself a, a whole uh, new world. So basically, we want to define our targets very clear, clearly when we go into a PhD. And that target is not only short term of four years, it has to be linked to your vision of next 10 years. And the reason why I say this is not only from my experience, but from the PhDs that are working with me. Majority of them, they have, before they started a PhD with me, before we had our quick informal interviews, we set up a target or their vision clearly so that I know what this candidate is coming, what, with what kind of mind frame to do what in the future. And this helps a lot to build up the relationship between the supervisor and the PhD. And it makes easy for the PhD candidate to basically to feel that he has full support of his or her supervisor for the longer run. And that's how they work together towards a successful PhD. So a target should be very clear. Uh, again, it can be fuzzy, it could be uh, incorrect, or it could have some flaws, but that's not a problem. Having that vision is more important because that vision will keep. We will be will, will keep being polished and reiterated over those four years or five years of PhD. That obviously has a subpart, which is a topic of interest, and this topic of interest is basically around what field does that candidate have, uh, basically expertise, be it how minor it is, but what expertise that he or she have that they can put in into a bigger picture of a problem that they want to vision themselves as a pioneer in 
over the next 10 years or so. So that topic also has to be decided early on together with the supervisors. Now, when I coming back to the career target, it also includes that you want to go as an academic life, you want to have an industrial job in R&D sector or whatever. But again, I've seen many students, by the time they start their PhDs and they finish their PhDs, the vision of their career switches. And again, that's totally acceptable, but they had something in mind. Now, when you do this, obviously, I'm always mentioning this part of supervisor uh, many a times over the last you know, couple of sentences. The reason is because supervisors are key to allow them. And supervisors usually act as the whole and sole boss of the PhD candidates. And I'm sure many of her, us have heard stories where we have had very tough or very unfriendly supervisors leading to a lot of you know, uh, unfriendly uh, end to PhDs without even completions. So identifying the right potential supervisor is also a key part of the candidate himself or herself. They need to contact them beforehand. They need to set up discussions. And believe me, to my experience and many others, hardly 10% of the faculty members respond back to your interest in PhD. Again, it's not because the disrespect, it's just that they are maybe full of the potential that they can you know, spend time or invest into another PhD candidates. So it's our chance as a PhD, you know, seeking student to keep uh, approaching uh, potential supervisors. Again, this should not be random. It should be based on, again, my vision that I have set up earlier on. So if it's is it based on location, is it based on where I want to set up my career in the future? Is it based on certain type of industry that does not exist in my locality and so on? So that all those factors will allow me to judge and decide where do I want to do my PhD with whom, with which university. Now, again, university is another target because Universities are are based on ranks, and we as human beings obviously tend to behave in a manner the way these rankings are behaving, and we are very much influenced by that, and that's totally fine. But we need to always keep in mind that as a PhD, what uh, what a person looks into a PhD candidate or PhD outcome is firstly the publications, firstly, the PhD outcomes that that candidate has. Now, if someone, for example, in the field of, so I can talk about my field, in the field of wireless communications, the topmost journals are basically IEEE transactions in communications, wireless communications, and so on. Now, when I have a PhD candidate coming who has finished PhD, I would, the first thing I would question and look at is what and how many publications does this candidate have in, that, in those transactions? And again, is, are those publications as first author, they are purely by this candidate? If yes, then my secondary target becomes to look at with whom did he work with or with whom did she work with? And then I look at that supervisor. So when I, given the communities are not on, uh, beyond limits, these communities are very much linked in every domain. So it allows us to look at those supervisors because we usually tend to be aware and today's connectivity allows us to find their profiles very easily. So it becomes easy for me to understand what kind of supervisor did this candidate work with. And that allows me to understand that what kind of mindset this candidate might be having. And then we go into look, looking into the kind of university that they were associated with. So university label allows them for uh, an extended mentorship, an extended uh, skill development that comes based on the environment in that kind of university. So this is the kind of level, again, this is not a standard rule, but this is kind of the way people look into the candidature of a graduated PhD into next levels of their career. So we need to, looking at these points, you want to be very, very critical and very careful on, in identifying our right supervisors, and the right university where we want to establish uh, or get our PhD from and then move on. Now, the options basically uh, after PhD is uh, when or when we start our PhD, we, we, we make a, we, we are kind of committing ourselves for those four or five years. So we want to make sure that we continue. We continue till the end. There'll be many points, many dips in the graph, basically, and very, very less of peaks. Right. So those peaks are the moments of, you know, Eureka for us, are moments of alas, I got it. So those moments are to be harnessed, are to be cherished, and they come in time. They come with a lot of uh, patience. And that is what is required during PhD. 
But it happens many a times. We realize we're having all those dips in our PhD life. And we realize that we still want to do PhD, but after a year or two, we realize that my topic is not what I want to do after reading all this literature, after trying and failing or trying with little success. I've done some things, but I realize now in back of my mind that I, I want another topic, probably in the same field, in the same lab, with the same supervisor. It's possible. I want to go with a different topic, and I'm sure this is my career now. And that's totally fine. Never shy away. Many people just say, you know what, I'm not sure if my supervisor will agree. I'm not sure if I can do that, and so on. There are a lot of reasons that we make behind our mind. But we have to remember that that is the point that is defining because if we just shy off of asking and discussing this chance in such an early stage of my career, then I'm actually putting the whole career on stake because of that. It's too early in my career to make such hard decisions that no, I don't want to change anymore. Because you have a huge career in front of you that you have to live and you want to live that with content and not with regret. So it's always acceptable to go and talk to your supervisor or your funder and discuss with them that I appreciate what I've done, all the support that I've received, but I think now I have found my direction clearly now. I was in, in, in haze before maybe, but now I know what I want to do. And putting this discussion forward allows one to explore the opportunities. And many a times, a very good understanding supervisors will, will be very happy to accommodate this. But again, it has to fit in the funding scheme that you are there. If one is self-funded, that's fine. One is funded by the government or by the nation, that's also fine, they can talk to them. But if they're funded by the supervisor himself or herself, then they need to re-theme or reallocate the kind of funding that you have. But again, that's a headache of the supervisor. Let, them, let him or her deal with it. You, do not, you don't have to worry about that. Your worry should be making sure that you get what makes more sense to your career and to your intellectual property. So discuss with it, discuss with the supervisors and make sure that you attain or go into the direction that you want to do. And that is totally acceptable. So once you have, let's assume now we are able to get out through our PhD, we are able to get through successfully through our type of, you know, uh, different uh, basically uh, topic discussions or what we want to do. Now within PhD, what we want to do now, let's come back to the topic definition or type of work. What can we face? We want to identify or invent a real life problem. And again, as I said before, with a long term vision, probably at that time, our vision could be only for PhD. But if there is an allocation in my intellectual property, I can always look at it for a next decade or so. Now, we want to make our efforts count. Every single moment within the PhD is accounting towards your development of your personality. It's not only the intellectual property that you're, you're improving. It's not only some skills that you're improving from technical point of view, but there are many numerous soft skills that you, you're, you're developing. How to come up with, how to establish that friendly relationship with supervisors, then relationship with the lab colleagues who are doing research in different domains, in different fields, but you are working in the same environment. Uh, then how to come up with uh, relationships with collaborators or different co-supervisors. How do they deal with you in terms of the main supervisor and so on. So everything is contributing towards your personality as a PhD in totality. So you, it, it comes as a total picture when you come out as a PhD. It's not only the degree that matters, it, it, it does matter what kind of skills that you have gained over the time. And that's, what, that's when I mentioned the supervisor part and the university part play a major role. Now let's boil down to <clears throat> the technical detail of the type of work that you want to do into PhD journey. Now this work obviously could be very theoretic, theoretical, which will be <clears throat> validated through simulation tools. It could be purely experimental, but again, you'll go with a lot of theory behind to make sure that you're up to the mark of going into experimental studies. It could be mixed of both, which usually requires a little more time. And there are exceptional ones that <clears throat> end up being entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial. So <clears throat> that, say, that said is basically, it allows you to convert your ideas or your experimental outcomes into a product and you go into economic side of that research. So you define, and again, when you're defining the type of vision for your career or for what kind of PhD work you're gonna do, this kind of implicitly falls into them. 
So make sure that you have this thinking also behind your mind that what kind of research or what kind of research work you want to do uh, or in, in your PhD. And obviously, it, irrespective of what kind of work you're planning, which kind of work you're planning, always remember back in mind that you want to publish, you want to come at the global scale with at least two top tier Q1 journal articles. This defines the baseline of what you can achieve. No matter after these two publications, after three good journal publications, it's fine. You decide you don't want to continue in publication part. You still want to do research or from development perspective or from entrepreneurial perspective or something else. Uh, or you want to just simply focus on industrial R&D where they do not bother much with publications. But it sets up a, uh, a baseline for yourself and for people who look at your profile, that's it. This person knows the basics of, of what goes into research. He or she knows how to write a paper. They are successful in their career because of their strong baseline. There are many people who do graduate with PhDs, even over here in the UK, but they do not publish. They probably publish one, or they publish maybe four or five papers, uh, maybe first and second authors as well, but not even in a Q1. It's usually in Q2 or many conferences. It's fine, it's acceptable. All of them count. But what I'm saying is, as a top quality, what you want to achieve is at least to Q1 journals by the time you graduate as a PhD. So I've already talked about the kind of soft skills that you can gain. Now the soft skills to expand on that is basically you can have skills in terms of learning different softwares, that's the technical part. But you learn, for example, the writing bit. You know, the writing in technical domain is very different from what we write in our other, you know, generic articles or essays or whatever it is in our daily lives. The PhD writing, or let's say the writing of the, PhD, the, the research articles is very different. Uh, and you learn this, it's, it's a huge skill. Now, that's still part of the technical uh, domain. But there are many other things that you learn. For example, the articles that you write in research are can be written in our so-called Microsoft Word that we all are usually familiar with. But there are softwares that are automated and they bring beauty out of your writing in terms of the appearance and that is for example LaTeX. Now LaTeX allows you to prepare a very raw documentation, put different codes or different uh, basically commands and that converts your document into such a nice piece of output. The figures can be done there, the tables and so on. So that is one kind of soft skill that majority of PhDs today are gaining through different institutions. Now that's one part. That, other than that you establish basically links uh, in different research groups within the university based on different kind of interdisciplinary nature of your project or the collaborative nature of yourself. And that allows you to develop skills for collaboration in future. And that is very, very important in today's uh, research, let's say, domain. It allows you to not only establish the collaborative uh, network, but it allows you to work in interdisciplinary fashion. You might have a big idea, but if you do not have that collaborative network to bring expertise from different domains for that big idea, it becomes much more challenge for yourself to envision or even to embark uh, on that uh, you know, research problem. Okay, so those are the kind of soft skills and many more that you learn through time. Now, let's come back to a little more heart of the research career. Now, once you finish your PhD, you have two successful journal papers and much more. You are a very good PhD graduate. Now, what next? So either you have already decided that you want to go back into uh, a basically P uh, an academic, you want to continue an academic life, let's say. So you try to gain faculty position. That is your ultimate goal if you want to establish an academic career. Now, to do that in today's uh, you know, way how we are functioning as an academia, it has uh, the, the postdoc transition has, the bubble of postdoc transition is expanding quite a bit now. And the reason for that is, <clears throat> again, there could be many reasons, but the reason I look at it and the way we have perceived collectively over here as colleagues is basically the number of PhD graduates coming out uh, daily compared to, or let's say annually, compared to the amount of faculty positions that we can afford or that are needed is basically the gap is increasing. And that gap is welcoming uh, the need of postdocs. Now what happens as postdoc, again, it's a win-win situation. 
we should not uh, people do look at it neg negatively i myself some also used to look at it as negatively at that time but i really have to thank my postdoc transition period it really boosted a lot uh, of my basically career so what happens at is basically you have that basic experience as uh, a, a, you can you can look at a full problem uh, as a phd graduate in postdoc you get a freelance chance to work on either the defined topic by your funder, or if you have won your own funding for postdoc for two or three years, it allows you basically to look into that topic for your time period of two to three years or whatever funding you have. You have full time, you have no supervisor nag on you, exceptionally there are sometimes, but in general, no. You have your own time, you have no other courses, no other, uh, obligations within the university is purely based on research. You have full time for yourself to boost your research career. And by the time you graduate as PhD, many do have plan of future papers or future you know, problems that they have already identified and they plan to work if the time permits. And this is the time that happens. So you, again, revise your vision, obviously, on your research area. You strategize for the next 10 years. It becomes easier to strategize at that point in time because you have that basis behind yourself. And then you start targeting that you want to publish at least, you know, a good number is usually three to four journal articles uh, on an annual basis. It's a higher end. Having two is perfectly well. Having two annual journal articles as Q1 is perfectly fine. So you focus on research part. But now, given that you have a vision to establish yourself as an academic faculty member, then you want to prepare yourself. This is a good chance for yourself. Instead of getting into academic position and then you realize that you have a lot of things to do and learn, it's better that you use this post of transition period to learn those skills as well. What does that mean? So as, an, as a faculty member, you always want to have uh, funded, you know, funding with you. And to do that, you have to come up with successful proposals. And then you want to have a research group having your own postdocs and PhDs to support your research uh, ideas or research track. So to, it's not sensible to wait all the way till you are into an, a faculty position. So why not prepare yourself at this point in time as in, during the postdoc transition to come up with research proposals to the funding agencies wherever you are based in? And usually most of the postdoc supervisors will allow this because at the end of the day, it benefits them. They will become co-PIs uh, in those projects. They will help you. They will have expertise from their experience, which they will be able to share with you. And fix it. so you get a groundwork to work on to become a very good proposal you know, writer. <clears throat> so if you have those ideas, you can translate those into research proposals. Even if they're unsuccessful, you don't lose much because you are anyhow in a, in a transition period. You want to get into a permanent position soon or as a faculty position soon. But then it gives you a flavor of the positives and negatives while going through the process of preparing research proposals. This is a very key point, by the way. So we, no one should lose this chance. Another bit that I want to add here, which is not on the slide, is basically try to get a chance to teach during the postdoc. Many places, the postdocs do get a very small percentage of teaching assignment. That does happen, but it's kind of not so beneficial uh, compared to having a full course or at least half a course to teach and administer in terms of examinations, quizzes, and so on. So try to get a chance through your supervisor, through your department where you're based as a postdoc to pursue a chance of teaching. And there is a high chance that you might be given a teaching assignment. It could be as a subsidiary to a main faculty member or a main course that's been taught maybe in early years, and that's fine. But then it gives you a chance. Uh, it gives the postdoc a chance to establish that part into your basically in your profile. Because when you go and you start applying for faculty positions, the things that we want as a faculty is basically a, an acceptable research portfolio. And obviously, having some experience of teaching will give an edge compared to someone having no teaching experience. So use this postdoc transition to your benefit to bring that bit also into uh, your profile. And I have seen myself, uh, not only from my experience, but many others, 
who have purely focused on research part in postdoc compared to people who did equally well in postdoc in terms of research, maybe a little less, but that was above the par, but they were able to obtain this kind of teaching experience and they were always at the edge to get a very a quick faculty position after their postdoc. On the other side, the people who kept on doing excellence in, uh, in, in research, no, 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 nothing wrong about it, but they again had to go for a second postdoc or an extended postdoc period to realize that they have to attain more before they go into a faculty position. So those are the kind of things that we want to primarily focus into our research part, but add these you know, small add-ons as an academic career. But now at this point, if you go into after PhD, if you think that no, you wanna to go to industrial R&D, there's no point in spending too much time as a postdoc. You can right away start applying, go into R&D sector of different industries and see that's the right place for yourself. Many people during the postdoc, they try to establish more of their ideas that they had from before in two years, get some outcomes, translate that into economic value, and then they go into R&D of industry and that's sort of fine. So again, industry R&D has, has its own challenges, but they do not have the challenges that we're seeing in academic life. The, their kind of challenges are more purely based on business perspective. How does your approach of research uh, brings value to their company, to your business? And that's what they, they will try to gauge when they interview you. So having that kind of vision and explanation to your research uh, basically approach will give you a very good chance to get into industrial R&D. Now, coming back to the postdoc part itself, there are small bits and pieces that you want to do as well. That is, keep be, be active in the community by reviewing for journals. Uh, this allows you to look at or find out what is happening in different research groups, what are people targeting, and it gives you a sense of belonging and also gives you a sense of satisfaction that what you are doing is probably not so off the way, not off the novelty or not off the, the need of the time. So these are the kind of things that help you to chip. Again, this is not necessary, but it is just a matter of what you think as a sense of belonging and satisfaction. Another bit which will directly relate to what you want to do as an academic life is to mentor PhD. Now mentoring PhD is also equally applicable to industrial R&D because even in industry, uh, there are PhDs uh, who are funded by the different different companies uh, or the R&D institutions or different companies, and they have a mentor from the industrial side as well. So doing this kind of activity of mentoring the PhD of your uh, supervisor, so your main supervisor uh, ha will, will be having their own PhD students. So, and many times they will, by, by default, uh, assign those PhDs to the postdocs to, to mentor them. Uh, and if you don't have the chance, you can always request. So mentoring those PhDs, so you are not the sole supervisor, you do not lose anything, but it gives you a chance of training them and feeling yourself, what will it be in, in academic life when you become a faculty to deal and to train such kind of PhD uh, students. So the key point of postdoc outcome is basically, always remember, it's purely transition. Never think of it as a permanent place that you want to stay in. There's no promotion. There is nothing over here. People have come up with a lot of titles of changing that to research uh, assistants or uh, sorry, research scientists and associate research scientists and so on. At the end of the day, everyone looks at it as a temporary postdoc position, and that's it. So don't get bogged down or don't get you know happy or fooled by, uh, sorry for using that word, but in, in a fun way, that... that uh, Oh, I have become a research scientist. Uh, again, I'm not saying research scientist in industrial life. No, that's very different. I'm talking about someone saying research scientist with a temporary contract just doing the research is not actually a research scientist. Yes, there are academic labs where they give you long-term five to 10 years of research scientist contracts. Those are actual research scientists. That's fine. But a research scientist saying for one year, two year is actually nothing but a postdoc in itself, okay? So make sure that you do not get so deceived away sometimes by these uh, lovely titles. Now, let's move into the industrial career. What happens if we decide to go into industry career as a PhD researcher? So you want to aim at research labs, right? There are many research labs 
in different industries. Uh, <clears throat> so you approach them, you find out what kind of job opportunities they have. And it, be it becomes easier that if you know that this is what you want to do, then towards the end of PhD, even third year or fourth year of PhD, you can always try to explore uh, internship opportunities with uh, those R&D labs. And it's usually possible. Uh, you go and even if you go over there for uh, internship without any benefits that you want to expect from them, just focusing for your development of your career. So this is a good chance. You go there, you, uh, you not only understand the environment of working in industrial research lab, you look at real life problems that are converted into business value, that are converted into happiness of the customers, of the people. So you look at that yourself primarily and that allows you to feel your research getting converted or coming to the ground into real life and then that gives you further motivation further push of doing the, the you know your research the way you're doing in a much better way so again as i said it's the industry is the mainstream economic contributor and that does give you that flavor but again there's another benefit of this if you have a vision of becoming an entrepreneur you want to convert your research outcome into an economic value, then getting this internship will allow you to understand what happens behind the scenes from that perspective. And then you can come back to your research lab in the university and work in that direction to converting that into a spin-off or into a, a successful economic value. It could be right away after PhD, you can go into entrepreneurial competitions, you can go into uh, basically startup funding uh, competitions to gain some uh, basic value to, to, to kickstart. Or you can go again and continue spending some more time in, industry, in industrial R&D and gain more experience and then come back and have your own outcome of that ideas that you have from before. So those are kind of aims that you put when you are going into industrial career, okay? so. A very easy thing is once I get an industrial job and that's it, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to keep getting, you know, higher and higher. And that's what you end up after 30, 40 years. You start becoming, uh, you know, a research manager and you control or you have the, 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 let's say, liberty of taking charge of the labs and having a big vision for the company uh, in the longer, longer run. So those are kind of things that you want to think when you go into industrial career. Again, research, your research basically will be the heart or at the core of all of this. Your comp all, remember, all, out of all this discussion, your core competency is your research and you are based on your interest, you know, paving the pathway of your research into that direction. Now, what you do as when you're in industry or you have your own companies, what you wanna do is, or you want to be known for are the patents that you have. That's one of the primary things. So you keep filing your patents, you keep securing your even a very small novelties that you have in the form of patents. And that's why usually industry, industry does not focus on publication side. They mostly focus on this kind of behavior of uh, securing uh, or filing the patents of their ideas. And this is the value. This translates into the value of that company or that industry. So <clears throat> there are academic partnerships that you also want to focus on. Because as an industry today, in this fast moving world, with the fast moving research in mostly all directions, academic research labs equally play a very, very huge role. Now, although the academic R&Ds do not envision their research outcomes the way industry does, but still they have those longer and uh, unseen kind of you know, visions, and probably many times some, some sort of unrealistic ones as well. But industry does benefit from that because industry, although they have the vision for 10, 20 years ahead down the line, but they'll convert that into business value always. always. So the failures are also converted into business values, but they always get these inspirations as well from the academic research labs. Because in academic research labs, the researcher is not confined by the business value. The, the, blue, the sky is blue for them. They look at whatever and they think whatever they, they, they feel they can or that it should be done. So this link together with industrial R&D and the academic research labs is always beneficial. Now the beneficial is not only from the vision perspective, but it's also from at the tiny bits and pieces that is having collaborative PhDs, collaborative postdoc positions, uh, and also for the academic 
uh, faculty member, if they establish this kind of link with industrial R&D, it allows them to have a more, uh, let's say, stable and more technically strong uh, profile because they have this link with industry, they have this relationship, and when they talk, they talk from both academic sense and the industrial sense. So this totality of expression of a research idea or research outcome gives a very, very strong opinion, and the audience respects that more, has more value because of that link, okay? So we want to establish this. And the other benefit for this is uh, in the longer run, and I'll talk about this in the next coming slides. So when you do this, obviously, as an industrial employee in an R&D career, you start becoming a global leader because from industrial perspective, when you talk about things that you are doing from business value and you bring this uh, view from academic research labs, then the, you talk about more realistic than what's happening from, let's say, young minds and how we can pick those visions that we probably didn't think of and see its business value and bring those into industrial research labs. And this happens a lot, actually. We have seen over here as well. So for example, myself, I was fortunate uh, two years back when I, ha I was having discussions with Toshiba uh, lab over here. We, we started the discussion of a very simple problem on mobile edge computing. Although that's not my field directly, and I was upfront that, look, this is not my field, but I have some expertise from performance point of view, which I want to connect with edge computing part and see what we can do together. And they all, all you know, right away, they welcomed the idea. They had discussions and they were right away happy to provide me a full funded PhD studentship. So it was a huge thing for me. I never even expected so. Having this quick discussion, initiating the discussion with basic idea, and them having a response, they said, yes, we are working on, we have a full lab on uh, edge computing uh, recently. We, we are trying to focus on that part. And what you are mentioning as an idea can definitely be very, very good for us. And that's it. So we were able to come up with that, you know, use that funding to come uh, to have a PhD student who was 50% being mentored by the industry directly. So this student gets a chance to stay in the industrial environment half the time. So they are working in real-time ideas over there. They're working with their R&D lab directly. And this is getting them uh, this benefit of when they graduate, they can, if they feel happy and they want to, they can continue directly in that lab. So, and I get benefit of uh, mentoring the student from my expertise, combine the ideas together, but also it gives me obviously the publications and the expertise that this student is bringing from the industrial lab, which I might not be able to invest the time in going multiple times to the Toshiba lab. So these are the kind of things that benefit when you go into industrial career to establish as well. And I, I already mentioned what benefit me uh, from this kind of link uh, as an academic person. So that's, uh, let, let's, let's top ourselves from industrial part from that point. And the reason why I want to stop that, because again, I am not into an industry R&D to that depth, but this is the basic depth that I have from my experience. But what I want to focus now next is research into as an early career faculty member, right? And this is my primary domain in what I have been spending my all last decade and more. So as an early career faculty, or, or let's say before I do that, if, if there are any questions that you want to take on, I'll be happy to uh, answer that. Okay, so I do see a question. Uh, or, yeah, what is the process of literature review? Should we summarize uh, an article or just take the related lines and paraphrasing those uh, and put them in our paper? Uh, this is a very, very nice uh, question, uh, Ms. Farhana. So basically, uh, literature review uh, is there's no one plus one equal to two solution to that. But there's a generic way how we do our uh, literature review. And what I suggest is always, uh, even to students who are not having the idea or the problem that they want to go ahead with, what is it that they want to do? Then I say, okay, since I will take the lead in a way to give them a broader picture of what I am good at, because I can't supervise a student 
in a field that is not close to me or I'm, I have no experience in. So what I do is I give them a basic survey paper and a basic theoretical paper, at least two to three uh, in two or three different topics that I am good at because I'm comfortable in that. And I say, okay, read these, summarize this to me first and understand what is out of there. Based on their presentation on the summaries of that, it allows me to understand how much are they able to understand the literature review part. So now having that understanding, I'm able to translate that and you know guide them what they should do next for literature review and what topic is suiting them more in which direction. Now, coming back to the question, as you mentioned, for literature review, literature review is, yes, it does uh, involve reading and understanding more than 100 papers. That's totally true. But the way you do that is basically the first step given, again, it all depends on what kind of time frame that you have for yourself. But usually it's much better depending, again, that's less thing that you have enough time in your hand. It's always good to look at the abstracts and conclusions of transaction papers at the first stage, because those are the top quality papers in that field. That will give you the idea of what they envision in their abstract for that 10 pages or 12 pages of work and how they have concluded with what kind of results. When you do that for maybe 30, 40 papers in a go, you'll realize you'll start making a mind map for yourself that what kind of work they're trying to envision in that direction or the recent, again, the target should be looking at the recently published papers first. So that will give you an envision. And then you select the papers that you'll go in depth. And then when you go into the depth, you start reading with the problem formulation parts. And in the problem formulation part, you start to extract those problems that they have looked into those top quality papers first. And then you again go into a subset where you find out which are the problems that interest, that interest you more and you go into basically looking at their, their solutions, their experimental results and so on. So this process gives you not only confidence, but gives you a, allows you to imagine a map behind your you know, back of your mind to, 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 to understand how to go ahead. But remember, this mind map is not only behind your mind. I have seen recent, even yesterday, I was looking at a survey paper on 6G. They have put this mind map of survey that they, that student was doing, and I just loved it because they, they have a very nice figure. And they've put down a mind map, then they have come up with a tree diagram starting from foundations, roots, all the way to coming out of fruits, and translate that into the way the student looked at the literature review. So think of literature review as a mind map that you're preparing for yourself from where you start. Now, it is not necessarily summarizing the articles and putting the related lines. I would not go in that direction. What I would suggest is you do summarize for yourself, but when you are presenting a literature review section in your paper, in your thesis, in wherever it is, you want to put down a storyline of your understanding and not the words or not the summary of what you read from those papers. It is easier, it's not wrong, I'm not saying it's incorrect to take the summaries and put them in, reword them and then cite them, that's fine. But a reader in that field or an expert in that field knows if this literature review is coming as your own storyline or it's simply a connection or rewording of uh, you know, summarizing that work. So put the summaries down in a raw document Put a connection to all the summaries that you have put in a proper timeline or a proper logical manner of that field. And then once that is in the back of your mind and you are able to relate to some sort of map or some sort of schematic, then you can start putting that storyline from A to Z in your own words. And this will actually be a pure literature review that will still be the information from the published papers. You will still be citing in appropriate places that from where you are putting these statements in your own words. But there will be a very good storyline of a page or two page, depending on what kind of literature, literature review you are preparing. But for a good transaction paper, let's say, you're expecting not more than a page of two columns of, let's say, uh, uh, or single, li single, space, single line spaced uh, basic literature review that story will be yours. And believe me or not, whoever reads it will never question 
the kind of story, they will never question the plagiarism part. They will never question, oh, it's just been picked from that paper or that paper. So this requires a hard work. I agree it's not easy, but this is an ideal way. Now, I cannot do this for all my students the same manner. I have one student who, without even me telling, has done this process. And there's another student, student who I have told multiple times, but he prefers always to put down those summaries in the paper. It's fine. I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time in rewriting the whole thing, obviously, but because it's a student's outcome. But I can train, I can guide, and it happens. So everyone has their own way, but an ideal scenario is to have your own storyline out of those summaries, and then you can start dipping down in the value or the kind of legitimate literature, literature review that you do. So I hope that uh, addresses the question that uh, was uh, faced over here. Perfect. So those are the questions for now. I will uh, continue the, the slides. Okay. So coming back to the heart of early career faculty. Okay. So this is uh, something that is very close to my heart because this is what I do. I enjoy. This is my daily life. Uh, I breathe this. So I'll be talking about this a lot. And I'm sure this links a lot to everyone over here because we are in mostly in faculty position over here. This is an academic institution, and this is what we want to do best. Now, as a faculty member, our primary goal is to have excellence in teaching and transferring knowledge. And this excellence in teaching and transferring knowledge, don't get me wrong, it's not from only the teaching part that we do, it's equally from the research that we do. And we will see how. So let's put this in our minds that we want to be excellent in what we teach and what we transfer to our, the, to our not say students in general, because we have PhDs, we sometimes have postdocs, they all fall into the category of learning and teaching. So I will say to everyone who is in that process of learning from you, then you should be excellent in giving that. And anything that you teach, if you're able to take it from a textbook or from wherever it is, you put that aside and you're able to give it in your own manner. You're able to convince in your own way and get this into the, the understanding and learning of the one who is trying to learn from you, your students or whoever it is, that is what is excellence. It could be in many different ways. There's never a one way or one track to do this. I myself over the past, I have I've been teaching full time over the, since four or five years now. And I have uh, been in two different institutions, but all this time I have evolved continuously every year, be it the same course the next year or a new course next time, I'm still evolving. And that's the beauty. I do feel that I'm starting to get a little saturated in some of the techniques that I use or do in my teaching, but this gives a sense of satisfaction when you see the feedback from your students or from the people who are associated in the learning process with you. Now, let's boil down to the research part. I'll come back to teaching as well towards uh, the later part, but the first half is the research itself. Now, why I'm doing this first? Because this is the primary goal to be over here. Now, remember, when you are a faculty at any institution, the, there is a sense of primary goal of every institution. There are many academic institutions. The primary goal is to educate, to teach, and there are many others who have a primary goal of research outcomes. And there are many, the last third, let's say, who are in, in between both of them. So all of these models are prevalent in major, all the major economies, and there's no correct or no wrong. All of them are doing equally important outcome-based you know, you know, work for the economies and for the global needs. Wherever you are based on, you will always have certain amount of research element. If you're purely in research institution, you will have major part of research. If you're in purely teaching, you will still have that very minor part of research as well. Now, what goes into research as, in, as a faculty is to have very, so ultimate, your ultimate goal is to have a streamlined track of research focused on a decade's vision. That's the practice usually people do. It could be smaller to five years, but anything smaller than five years does not speak good from a research vision. Again, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's always good to have at least five to 10 years of a research vision when you are into academic, uh, as academic faculty. 
Now, having that vision will require a lot of resources. Uh, let's say fulfilling that vision will require a lot of resources. And that resources will come in terms of funding, in terms of uh, manpower, that is your PhDs, your postdocs, uh, in terms of research labs, uh, in terms of connections and networks uh, from industry or other academic institutions, and so on. There are a lot of things that happen. All of these things will revolve around your strong research vision. And who will buy your research vision? And for that, you will have to come up with strong, attractive, and successful proposals. And once you have those proposals, you will be marketing your research idea to funding agencies, to different successful laboratories around the globe and attract their attention. Many people do this from different uh, perspective, but the idea is to gain visibility. The idea is to gain success and attraction investments. So it's just like basically you're trying to run a startup company, right? But you, in, in, in academic framework. So for that, you will not be gaining uh, business value. You're not gaining money out of it, but it's, an, a, a, let's say, a technical business outcome that is getting funding. But again, the funding is not in your hand. It's to support your research, basically. So proposals are at the heart of your research vision in an academic uh, career. You want to establish collaborations. How do you establish collaborations is a very critical part. Many a times we do some incorrect uh, let's say we take some incorrect steps to establish collaborations and that actually goes into a wrong direction. And sometimes we do some things too much and then it also hurts your career because it looks like as if uh, we're not doing anything ourselves. It's just that we are surviving or we are just looking at collaborations and that's it. We are not willing to pay back the collaborators. So what happens is basically for establishing a collaboration, you always identify who you, want to, who you want to collaborate with. The frequency of my mindset in my research vision should match the person who I want to work with, as simple as that. I can't just go uh, out uh, and just start collaborating with everyone, approaching everyone. Not only that it's a problem from my time perspective, but it's also that maybe I cannot even work with such and such person because my way of working is X and that person works in a Y way. Obviously, you will not know this from beforehand, and that's why you have to be very strategic in approaching your collaborators. Now, you know that there's some, you know some faculty member in your own institution who is a, an expert or who is much, much senior, who probably is at a professor level, who is expert in that field as well. He will never approach you or she will never approach you. It's my task as an early career faculty and there's nothing wrong about it. There's definitely nothing wrong about it. We do feel sometimes that why should I be approached? I'm enough, I'm independent now, I will do it myself, but that's not true. So I can approach them. And the way to approach is not that, oh, I want to collaborate with you. No, it doesn't, that, 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 that usually does not happen today. The better way is I have a research outcome. I have a research work, a research paper that I've done and I am planning to publish this or expand this into an experimental setup or whatever it is. I'm at a certain point in my research work. So what I do with that is I approach the senior expert. Now, this could be a professor in my own institution. This could be a faculty member in other academy institution. It could be in, in the same uh, country or it could be a faculty in different globally anywhere. Or it could also be an industrial expert. Now, irrelevant whoever it is, the way of proceeding will be kind of similar. That you have a well-defined, currently invest under investigation problem with some results in hand. You go and you approach with the idea frame, not the results, never disclose the results, with the idea frame that you have and the kind of results that you're envisioning. So you say that we have, we are working on this problem and we have envisioned that we are, ex we, we, or we are, have started seeing some recent results around these lines. They look very promising. There will be a breakthrough in X, Y, or Z things, no matter how small it is. But if this will be translated into, uh, into economic value or for industry or an academic or a, a top tier publication for academic uh, faculty member. When you put down this kind of objective, what kind of results you're expecting, 
and what will happen with these results, you're putting down a very three quick points to that person. Either of these three points will attract that person. It could be the problem itself that will attract. If not the problem, then the results might attract. If not the results, the, 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 the least possible thing is that the outcome of putting these results into publication will definitely attract someone. There's no harm in for them as well to accept this because it's not for free. If they accept this, they're going to respond. They're going to show their uh, basically willingness. And when they do that, they're going to start pouring in their feedback into what has been done, into sharing their own uh, experience into what can be done next. And you're going to take that and then start building your collaborative link. It could be very ideal and very smooth. It happens. Or it can also be, you know, at any point there could be misunderstandings or miscommunications and so on. Everything is possible. But this is how you will start establishing collaborations. And slow and steadily, you will take these collaborations to a next level, expand to different collaborators, and so on and so forth. In the time of five to 10 years, you can, if you keep doing this in a slow and steady pace, given you always have an, uh, a saturated potential that you can harness. So you use that and usually successful academic careers uh, who are envisioning a lot of research in their, in, their, in their career, they take five to 10 years to establish a very good collaborative network. And that five to 10 years with a lot of failed collaborations and a lot of successful as well, they come up with them together and they establish this very good collaborative group. And then they work together over the next 10 years and so on to keep expanding their uh, research outcomes. So it is a journey that you have to take on if you plan to go into that kind of successful research career. Very important because you will have your own ideas and combining them with the expertise of others will enhance the outcome enhance the quality and bring collaboration together interdisciplinary nature together. There's no harm if you do not want to do collaboration, there's no harm, but it will always be yourself with more challenges. If you're strong enough, there's no harm. And if you're content in, I am publishing a quality outcome, I am coming up with quality research outcomes, I'm not worried about the quantity, then you are doing something excellent. There's no, nothing wrong. So don't get worried about the numbers. It's easy for me to say today because I am getting that position, but when I recall six to seven years back, I was really being worried about the numbers, not only quality as well. And I'm sure many of us might still feel that. The feeling is not wrong, but we need to always find the trade-off for oneself that what I am content with, do I just want to worry about the numbers and numbers and numbers? Do I only worry about the quality and quality and just no numbers or something in between? Again, all of them are correct. There, there could be ethical issues when we go in the numbers. That's not the point of discussion over here. But if you decide where or direction you want to go with, you will know how to deal with this kind of part of collaboration. Okay. Now, similarly was the industrial partnerships. Industry is very, very tough they will never allow this number game or quantity game. They focus on quality. Their numbers are not the numbers publication. Their numbers are business value. So the more we want to approach the industrial collaboration, uh, collaborators, we will talk in business sense and they know what they do. They will never be fooled down and there will be hardly any ethical issues. And usually there are no miscommunications and no misunderstandings. Uh, usually, there is always a small percentage that's possible, but in majority of times, industry is very, very clean from the academic collaborator perspective because they do everything in writing, there are contracts to be signed, and they follow that. So once you have the idea of collaboration, you, either you do or not do, that's one's choice. Uh, it's one's choice. You're going to extend your research network with industry or not. But what next is to attract funding with the proposals? Now, all these three first points are proposal, collaborations, industrial partnerships will attract funding. Okay, <clears throat> so the more you can do this, again, based on your potential, you are increasing the probability of having more funding. And this funding will be translated into quality postdocs and PhDs. And obviously, that will in turn go into publications.
So when you have the funding, let's say you're successful. Now remember, I'll, I'll talk about funding as well now. So funding itself basically is, is, is very, very critical because the funding uh, is not like writing a research paper. Okay, it's completely different. Funding is a storyline that you are able to tell to your funding agency and they say, okay, that's it. That will bring the money to the economy. That will bring money to us. We are happy to fund that. That's the ultimate goal. How will that happen? So for that, you want to put down the document in a layman manner. Yes, you will have some expert or let's say technical depth in there, but you will start with a, a layman story of telling, like I will do, for example, I, I was writing a proposal recently and I, one of my, one of my colleagues, he, uh, he, he, he's with me actually. And he said, you know what, think, Imran, think about it, writing your proposal for your grandmother, who probably is not expert in this field. And think about that. You want to explain to her what is beyond 5G and what will she understand from your wireless communications? How will she perceive uh, the need of spectral efficiency and, 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 and security efficiency? And, that probably sounds lame, but it's not because when you start writing, after having that expertise or the experience of so much uh, research papers and the research writing, you go back to a layman writing in the research proposal, it becomes tough to stop yourself uh, again and again from going into the, the technical terms or technical depth. And that's another skill that takes some time. And that's why if you recall, we did mention that when you're in postdoc, try to spend some time to get this experience of proposal writing. So this is what I'm gonna do. In funding, we want to make sure we are able to sell our idea. It's, you don't have results at that time. You might have some preliminary results, but that, sh that will not be this whole and soul selling point. It will be the idea and the storyline converting into the strategic priorities of the funding agency and then the results, how we connect them a storyline of six to 10 or whatever is the requirement of the funding agency pages will translate that. And if they are feeling successful, you get the funding, right? Again, there could be a lot of discussion to funding itself. There's another workshop that we can do on full funding, how to attract uh, funding, how to attract the industrial collaborators for funding part, how to do uh, convincing presentations for funding. That's a huge story in itself, a huge learning in itself. But that's the gist of what we're gonna do when we want to attract funding. So once you have funding, you want to hire the right postdocs and the right PhDs. It is a challenge, especially for PhDs because PhD fundings are usually time bound four to five years, it's not unlimited. And it's usually it's not extendable, it's already four to five years. You want to get a PhD who remains committed. That it does happen many a times, that the PhD decides that, you know what, I can't continue PhD, I don't want to. Out of the middle, two years after the starting, what would you do? So as a supervisor, it becomes challenging because you have, you can't force the student to stay in. After all, he or she is a student. They have no obligations as such to leave. And you lose that funding amount. What do you do then in the remaining time? So it's a very critical hiring process for a PhD, you as a faculty have to be very, very clear into making this. But this is only for the case when you are funding that PhD. If you have a PhD who is self-funded or funded by their own uh, you know, nation or government, whatever it is, then this is not a big worry. But as a postdoc now, you want to hire, postdocs are usually hired by your funding, mostly. And then when you hire them, you want them to pay off. And you are hiring a postdoc because you don't want to spend time or invest time into training this person anymore. So that's why when you judge a postdoc, a PhD graduate, and that's why if you recall when I said to have at least two Q1 journal articles, because when I look at a candidate who's coming for a postdoc, if I see this in the, in the resume, in, in, in the, the CV of that person, that uh, this candidate has at least two Q1 journal articles as first author, on that topic, and I read those, I, I get a glimpse of that paper, and I understand what kind of quality this person has, it gives me confidence that I don't have to do anything with this postdoc. It's just the idea we have, I will explain to him, he can read the proposal that was successful for that funding, 
or she, and that candidate can be hired and they will do the business for me for two, three years. So you have to be very strategic in that part as well to hire the right people for your research uh, pathway. So this will allow you to keep publishing. You have the right postdoc in place, the right PhDs. You have a good, beautiful, cute little research group to start off with, and you start publishing. Publishing should be quality. And again, the publishing could vary, as I said before. It could be only focused on quantity or quality or something in between. It's you who decide how you want to be looked at in your career down the line after 10 years. Should people call me? Oh, yeah, this guy has, this person has, wow, so many publications. Excellent. And this guy's great. And I go into, into the depth of those publications and I see hardly any Q1 journal. There's nothing wrong from this. Believe me, there's nothing wrong. But it's just that be prepared that this is how I'll be looked at. Or on the other hand, I have very few publications, but majority of them are in Q1 journals. People will know this is a quality work and not the quantity work and so on. So it's your perspective, how you want to be looked at. So you strategize yourself what you want to focus on. Now, there's another key bit that we want to do. Publishing is not the end of the world, and it's not the end of the sto research story. As early career faculty, we think that is maybe, but by the time we grow, we come into mid careers or further, we, and we, the, the more we get involved with our engineering institutions around the globe or other institutions that are related to my field of study, those tell us that what kind of uh, Thing we can do with our research. So I did mention that we can translate our research into economic value. That's one of the things that I'm going to come down after two more points, I think. But for there's something called standardization. Now I can talk from my experience, for example, in wireless communications, the way we are moving from a generation to next generation every decade into our wireless uh, domain. Like for example, we are into 5G now, Talks are going on for beyond 5G and 6G for the next 10, nine years now. So what, how we translate that? The 5G brings in a lot of standards. Why do we need standards again is because so that we can have a more, let's say, uh, freedom of connectivity in the sense of uh, common ground. So everyone will use the same standards that have been agreed at the higher level uh, and then so that no matter where we go, we are using the same standards. So we don't have to change our devices or change our baseline, uh, you know, technical uh, implementations. So we want to translate our research outcomes into standards. So for us, for myself, being associated with IEEE, uh, which is the institution uh, that I am associated with in my field of study, we have standardization uh, basically track. So we sit down, sometimes for myself, for example, I sit down as, a, as an audience. I have learned a lot of things. And there was only one standard committee that I was able to contribute uh, indirectly that was the Visible Light Communications. And that was even three or four years ago. So I realized it's not the, the even at that time I realized that publication is actually a very small bit to actually convert that into a standard that will be used by people in real life. So that's a vision that we want to have. I want to translate all those Q1 publications into a standard. And that's where my value will come. So if I vision the standard, then that's the kind of research I will try to focus on. And that's the kind of results of quality I will try to envision from my postdocs and PhDs. So that's the standardization practice that I want to also go with. Now, there is always a small bit of filing patents, obviously, that is done more heavily from industrial perspective. But even as an academic person, if you do not have an industrial collaborator for that particular result or for that particular outcome of research, and you feel this has a very good copyright value or very good uh, investment value, then you might want to patent that. Uh, filing patents is good in academic life, again, but it does not actually hold, again, to my experience, I might be wrong to some extent, but over here, filing patents as an academic faculty is not desired. It's not something that is looked at very important. So our job is to come up with the outcomes and get linked with industry and get it patented through industry. And we want to work in that interdisciplinary fashion in the logical manner. 
But again, it, it's, it depends how it's looked at different institutions. Different nations have different perspective of patents. Many places, industrial R&D is not probably that active, but there are some academic research labs collaborating with uh, international industrial labs, and they are able to file the patents, uh, be it US patents or anywhere else. Uh, ma major economies have their own patenting, uh, you know, basically uh, directions as well, which can also be pursued with no problem. Now, the key point that we want to talk about, again, quickly before closing the research part I'm going to be teaching is the spin-offs. We do feel sometimes our research outcomes are extra quality, then can we convert that into a small spin-off and put that company out and probably that spin-off in a year, two or three or five years time might shape its way, be it a small business, be it into a small entrepreneur market, that's fine, but it can be then acquired by a bigger company. And that, given that I want to still be a mainstream faculty member, then this could be a way of envisioning my idea getting translated into economic value. And again, there's no harm in that. This is something very good because you create business for yourself. What, what happens, what's the benefit of this is basically, you can come up with this small entre, enterprise basically, and this gets associated as a small business to your academic lab. So you as a person, by the time you are in mid-career, you are not only an established researcher, you not only have your research lab or research group with postdocs and PhDs, but you have been able to, out of all this hard work of 10, 20 years, you probably came up with an outcome that was translated into economic value, which gets associated and remains as a small company. You don't, you're, not, you're not saying that it has to be a global leading uh, mainstream business, but a small business that is known globally because it has a very niche outcome of your research. And that becomes a spin-off and gets connected to your lab. So you as a researcher become not only an academic success, but also uh, a kind of business success. And also this gives a feel of industrial R&D. So then when you have this industrial or let's say as business perspective to your research lab as a research outcome, this becomes the source of more uh, quick connections with industrial R&Ds all throughout. And then you you grow very fast. So your company or your small business remains intact as it is, but it becomes a source to expand your research domain with more manpower, more funding, and more success stories. Again, this falls into what kind of research strategy one is thinking for themselves. So spin-off is another way. There are, so not many do this, but there are exceptionally few who do this Many fail as well, there's no harm. You, it, you should be strategic enough that it should not affect your career as a mainstream faculty, but you can always pursue this if you have that vision. Finally, into research, uh, which I wanted to focus is the teaching side. I'm leaving off the last sub bullet point pedagogy, which I'll link with the other point towards that. So, so I hope that is clear from research perspective. Uh, and if there are questions, I'll take them together. I think I'll just complete the, the teaching part as well and then we can go into those discussions together. Now, as a faculty, you look after senior design projects or capstone projects or finally, whatever label you give them, but those are the final projects in the final year of the degree program, uh, undergrad, undergraduate degree programs. So as a faculty, you it's your strategic uh, vision that you look at the potential of the students that are working with you on those projects. And, if you're able to find the potential, you are uh, you have as as a mentor, as a faculty, you can always discuss out of the project line, discuss with that student, and tap that potential to not only maybe your benefit, even if not your benefit, at least the benefit of the research community in your domain. And this should be done again very cleverly. And the example for this I can give you for me at least for now. And the reason I mentioned this is because of my current. Uh, so I have six uh, final year project students this time, and I'm actually the coordinator for the whole final year project program in our degree program, which has 420 some students this year. Six are working with me directly. Out of those six, one has been exceptional. She finished the project in half the time, 
And then I said, it's up to you. You have done project. You, can, you will definitely score a very high grade in this. There's no problem. But she said, no, 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 no. I want to work on something more. I had a research problem that I was working on with one PhD student. And then I expanded that problem and included her. And she is doing a great job. Then I saw that she can do much more. And then I started giving her more directions to explore. And she has started preparing a PhD proposal right away. That is, she doesn't want to do master's. She And she is eligible to my experience and to my knowledge, besides some basic coursework, in terms of research, she can jump into PhD directly with me. And I wouldn't mind hiring her directly as PhD if she agrees that she wants to. So it's that kind of thing that you want to tap the potential and get those. And it's not only for your benefit, it's benefit for that candidate because it, it, you are harnessing and telling that candidate, look, you have this potential, you can do this and this and this. It's their choice to decide to do or not. They might just have some other, some other objective for their life or for their career. So this is the kind of things you always want to translate your teaching practices into how you link that with your mainstream research vision. Now, apart from that, you are also serving as into different committees in your department. Obviously, as a faculty member, the primary goal is to bring your institution to excellence. This should be at the heart of your uh, employment with that institution. Yes, your core business is the research that you, you, that you are known for, but you should be equally known for your uh, contributions that will bring your institution to a very high level. And this will not only come from the research directions, but there are many other trivial or tedious tasks that we end up doing sometimes. And we don't feel satisfied about that. Is this what you have to do? But believe me, it is an equal, uh, equal and important part of a faculty member to contribute to these committees, to be part of them. And this not only gives you a growth, probably in a smaller sense, it does give you a growth, but if you look at it strategically, you, you make use or be in that committees to establish links through different parts or different departments or different you know, uh, sub uh, committees within that institution, within your institution, or if those committees are uh, having a nature of external connections, then that allows you to build those connections as well. So being part of that, you contribute to the success of the institution, but that also pays back to bring in links for your core competency of your research career. So never take that as a negative part, but always be strategic. So there's sometimes you're put into committees, you have to serve uh, you know, loyally in those, but sometimes you have option to select from multiple committees, uh, and then you have to be strategic enough which committee will your expertise be benefiting both ways. So that should be, again, your way to uh, select the committees in the right way forward to benefit correctly from your side and to benefit from them as well for the whole institution. So th that's one part from, let's say, the academic perspective, uh, from the success of institution perspective, because success of institution will bring success to my name. Success to my name will bring success to institution. It goes hand in hand. Now, moving beyond that, as a faculty member, Besides all the research activities and bits and pieces that you have talked about, we want to be active in reviewing many research proposals and journal articles, mostly proposals, because you want to get associated with funding agencies, not only for your own proposals, but also looking at what are what is being submitted and what are people envisioning in your field of study for their next five years of research directions. So this kind of reviewing practice will give you that picture. And it will give you a fair chance to evaluate as well and become part of the global uh, national and the global community for the one who is setting the trend or setting the, 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 the stone for what should be and how should be uh, the research done in those directions. There are other bits and pieces that is participating in technical program committees, in workshops and tutorials, in different conferences and so on. Uh, this could be from technical perspective, that is publishing your research work, presenting them, basically, quote unquote, selling your ideas, selling your results, attracting people to your research. But it can also be from teaching perspective. For example, what we are doing in this session right now 
is a session. It's kind of a learning session uh, from teaching perspective, from career perspective. Uh, we can't say this is not beneficial to me. For me, it's very beneficial because I am reviving what I should do in my daily life, which I enjoy, but I'm getting a chance to meet you all and anyone who might be interested in discussing research careers or research topics or teaching topics, probably that's something that we both will benefit. So every, all these bits and pieces will bring value to oneself and to the other selves. And then there is a bit of esteem. And as I said, this is kind of linked with the other phrase that I used before that my success will bring success to the institution and success to institution will bring success to me. So I want to make sure my activities bring esteem to my institution, not only to myself. So I will take the name of my university everywhere. Like I talk to you today, but I belong today to University of Glasgow. That's my affiliation. So this goes back to the University of Glasgow. I can claim that this is what I've done and this will be linked to their profile ultimately. So I'm trying to bring esteem to my institution collectively. And this should be a part of my faculty career. And obviously all these things will link to my promotion chart. Every institution have their own promotion criteria. You want to link to them. You want to link how much of research contribution is actually part of it. Many a times we tend to, because we love to, so we tend to do a lot of research, but probably in the promotion criteria, it's not a requirement to do so much research. And when it goes under review, they say, what about the other bits? What about de departmental contribution? What about your workshops? Have you organized any uh, special issue in, 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 a, in a journal? And we don't know, we, we have not done those we, because we kept doing what we are enjoying more, which is not wrong. But given if I want to get promoted, I lost the chance because, or I lost that potential that I could have balanced in the right manner, meaning I should be doing uh, research in the right balance and also contributing to other bits and pieces that are part of my uh, basically uh, position where I am. So those are the things that we want to look at as, as a faculty. One final thing before we move away from this is a pedagogy or scholarship on teaching, learning and teaching. This is something which is relatively new for me as an experience. And I have been, uh, hope, I mean, let's say fortunately successful to publish uh, one journal article and two uh, Q1 conference publications in this field. And I have also was successful last year to receive a very small funding, very small, but it's not so much of value, but it just gives a sense of feeling that what I am teaching, I'm translating that into a global value or a global best practice by through publication. And that small funding allowed me to hire a very, uh, let's say, a, a teaching assistant for a very short term to do some analysis for my teaching feedback and for a new uh, kind of uh, marking uh, best practice that I created for my department over here to do some kind of basic analysis for that. So what I'm trying to say here is many times our technical research is something that we do good in PhD, maybe at postdoc, and then we realize, you know what, maybe I don't want to do that. And maybe it's too much for me. I want to just relax. I want to have a simple faculty life teach, be excellent in that, and that's totally fine. But maybe you have that potential which we, we don't realize is to translate our best teaching habits, be it projects, be it the quizzes, examinations, assessments, feedbacks, PowerPoints, teaching methods, using videos or interactive tools, whatever it is. All of this can be translated into a formal manner as a scholarship. So this practice will become a scholarship and you can publish as a pedagogical research. So you make them as a more formal methodologies, you convert them into some sort of uh, scholarship questions, and then you do basic surveys, basic focus groups of uh, understanding what people think about those methodologies, how people perceive or how students have perceived your teaching habits, how different faculties perceive those practices and translate those into some sort of outcome of archival journal publish them, present them, and these best practices get basically published, publicized. And people start using your best teaching practice and they want to implement those because many people might not be aware of those good practices. They might not be, or they might be questioning, will it work, will it not work? But looking at your results or your publication, they'll be able to harness that. 
So yesterday itself, we had invited one uh, from Khalifa University in, in UAE. So he, uh, he, he teaches basically embedded processors and he taught, he, he gave a new perspective of teaching from last year, he changed his, and not only because of COVID, but apart from COVID, he changed his teaching style off uh, with the motivation that, look, there's a huge literature, huge teaching material on YouTube now for almost every other subject, uh, in, especially in undergraduate first, second levels. So he said, I have started picking up those expert videos, lectures that probably I might not be able to teach in that fashion. It's not that I don't have knowledge, but if they are much better being perceived by students, then why not I give them that glimpse in the lecture and I support that with some examples and tutorials or real life, uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, problem solutions. So in that way, students learn from those videos which they were directed to in their own time. And the class time was more used into interactive manner. The other bit that he talked about was using the virtual learning environment and in, in, you know, putting down all the quizzes of coding the, the processors uh, in there and ensuring that all of them are taking part. And then he did a, uh, an analysis at the end of how many students uh, took part in that quiz in the first week and how many delayed them. And then he made a mechanism of giving the marks differently with the agreement of, of obviously of the students and the department from beforehand. And he did the scoring in that way. He got a very good, uh, basically great uh, graph for the class. So what I'm saying here is you're translating your best practices into more formal way and that will bring value to yourself as a pedagogical researcher, as an excellent teacher, as an excellent faculty member. And this will obviously bring name to the institution as well. Now, one of the things that we did, for example, was uh, translating our assessment feedback mechanism uh, by, especially because of COVID, we came up with a virtual learning environment online examination, which had randomized uh, questions. And we had a permutation uh, formula for that. And we had basically uh, a timed examination, equally timed as, or maybe five minutes more than the sitting examination, physical examination. And we saw a huge uh, you know, survey uh, or huge results out of them, and we were able to publish that. So what I'm saying here is, again, that translate your best practices and bring value out of it. Don't just leave it to yourself. Again, it's on your interest, but this is a very huge direction that people can focus their research interest in that way as well, not necessarily the technical research. So I think enough of that. And probably what I will do here is I'll stop here and I can probably take uh, quick questions uh, if there are. And the last two slides are not that important per se, but I can cover up if, if we need to in the, in the interest of time. So uh, in terms of questions, uh, yeah, I. Do not see any question, but if anyone has any question, you want to unmute yourself or write down. Participants can unmute and ask the questions, please. Hello. Yes. Hello. I, I find uh, uh, here in India, the research is happening in more uh, unstructured way because we don't know what to do. There are no proper uh, guidelines, uh, the roadmap and all those things. How about in UK? It's happening in more structured way. With a lot of uh, like, or how do you feel it? Uh, thank you, Leo. I think it's a very good question, and this is very important for any researcher to uh, you know path their research uh, direction. So, uh, the way it happens in the UK is basically, or maybe probably the, the the established economies, is basically the research strategy is defined as a vision by the nation. So over here, the, the education ministry, uh, and not only the education ministry, but they have a specialized uh, agency under those ministries that look after the research part. And they invest huge, they invest in billions, right? So like just recently, they had a research vision of 2050, what they want to see, and they broke it down into the major chunk that was for 2030 for the next nine years. Or, or, or so. So what we do here is obviously we look into that and we see which fields do we fit in or my expertise fit in and how I can contribute to those. 
And then again, and given that today's interdisciplinary nature is very easy to bring your expertise to any bit. And then we envision that we put our proposals accordingly. But the key point here, what they do is those strategies that they come up with are linked also with the successful big industries over here. So for example, myself, I work very closely with the British Telecom, that's a BT. Uh, or maybe I can say that could be, for example, uh, uh, Reliance or Tata in, uh, in India. So I'm in close touch with them. And then there's a small company, for, that's LiFi, which is a very niche company in my field. They are very small, but they are also linked to that strategy to some extent. So basically, I'm trying to link myself with those two because that's my potential. And I'm using that to link to the main strategy. So whenever I have an idea that I want to focus on in the next five years, I go to that company, sit down with them, discuss these ideas, again, not disclosing everything. But given that we have the relation now, we are able to talk more freely. And then we strategize our funding program or funding targets uh, uh, for the next two, three years accordingly. So yes, you're right. That allows us to work in a more a strategic manner in a more well-defined manner because and we feel we know that how we are contributing to the economy uh, towards that strategy uh, again obviously i don't know how it happens in india i've i've not, not worked per se directly in the recent times over there to that extent but i do feel and i do believe there must be a strategy from the education perspective and also from what they envision to uh, for the economy as a primary what they should be known for in the longer run. So if that can be linked to the IITs, let's say, to the big institutions, and more importantly, to the big industries out there that bring in economic value to the research part, and then that gets translated to all the institutions and all the researchers or the research labs, and then they can bring the structure down there. Again, that's obviously not my domain how to do this, but just a quick example over here, for, like in the 6G, we are talking about going into space. The five up to 5G, the talk has always been about establishing a terrestrial-based communication systems, and we have looked into a huge depth of problems and come up with you know numerous type of solutions that have and good number of those have been translated in, into industry and a good number of those have been translated into standards and that's how we have the 5G today. Now for the 6G, the idea mainframe idea not only from the researchers, it has been in uh, basically uh, complementary with the nation's uh, envision of having this as a non-terrestrial based communications that is going above the land or below the land. And that's what I'm, so I have expertise, let's say, in free space optical communication systems. I know how they work. I know how to do basic performance in theoretical fashion, what the assimilations to be done and so on. Now I'm trying to link that expertise that I have with uh, doing that communication practice in space. Going into early level of space that is LEO, low Earth orbits, having CubeSats, or going into underwater, looking at how we can have the base station kind of uh, system into underwater. So basically, these are the things how we want to link and we do our research with. Uh, so I hope that addresses some part of your uh, comment or question that you mentioned. Uh, but I, I, this is the best I probably could uh, say. Thank you, thank you, thank you, sir. Okay, so if uh, there's no further, then what I can do is probably I can... Uh, just one second, sir. Any, any, any more questions, please, participants? I have one last question. Uh, yes. Sir, uh, in India, people get funds from the government agencies, and uh, they do the projects, but uh, eventually there's no use of the projects. After completion of the projects, I find there's no utility of the projects because once they finish their work, then they're gone. That's all. It's simply lying idle for uh, lakhs of rupees investment, the government money. Simply, there's no continuity of how to utilize the outside world. That is not happening in India. How about that, sir? This is this is a very good uh, concern that you have raised. Uh, so I, I I kind of agree with that. It happens sometimes over here, as well. but again over here they are they have a, a good vision in place. So as I mentioned, when I'm working with BT, uh, they keep a track of what I'm doing. 
But after two years of project, if they realize that what I have done is nothing that is beneficial, they will just leave it. Although I might have very good quality publication, the results might be promising to me, but if BT doesn't think that it is beneficial, then they will just leave it. So it will lie around. But this is very less. Given that we work with them collaboratively, uh, this allows us that the results get translated into value. At least it goes into testing phase. At least it goes somewhere. That's a different story that it, it does not become part of standards because obviously not all the research go. It's a very small percentage that, that, that gets translated into real life. Now, what I, what I see is basically in India, again, with such a huge you know, economy and such a, a huge potential of growth, uh, I feel and I believe in this, that there should be successful industries that should become or uh, that should come at the heart of research. And they should become uh, an interface between the funding, as you mentioned, the funding agencies and the people who are working. So that this will allow for a more streamlined, real practical research uh, happening for a more better value. Uh, probably that will help and make life uh, more better in terms of research perspective. Uh, I'm not sure what else can be done, but that is more of a, a corporate side that they should take interest in to make this happen instead of just focusing on plug and play, picking technology from outside. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very good afternoon. Thank you uh, for a wonderful session. And I uh, can we have an email ID of yours, please, so that. Uh, as a potential collaborator, yes, thank you. Yes, no problem. Uh, yeah, I, I was putting, I had it in my last slide. So anyhow, uh, if is there any other further question before I uh, do a, a quick <laughs> conclusion to uh, the discussions that we have had? Okay, okay, so I'll continue with uh, what I had with me over here. So basically, uh, another thing that I mentioned briefly about the standardizations is the role that you play with uh, your organizations in your field. So myself, I have been associated as a student member with IEEE. The fees was almost negligible. So I said, I don't lose much. Let's go ahead and get an idea. And slowly when I grew, I not only got chance to contribute to the institutions, these generic institutions of our community, from young professionals' perspective and also from uh, nominations and appointments perspective, which I'm part of recently, this allows me to get a global picture of what different experts are willing to do in their life. I, I, I see nominations from professors, from uh, CEOs who want to be part of the institution at, at high levels. So this tells me that they are heavily involved in translating their work from their companies and from their research labs and academic uh, institutions via IEEE or via their institution, home institution, that brings them together. So this is a very good, again, it's not necessary, but this brings value to esteem part of your faculty career. And also, this allows you to extend your collaborative net network. Again, it depends on the time. The similar thing that I have done with IET, that's Institution of Engineering and Technology, in different formats, uh, and also I got a chance to be judge uh, in these innovation uh, awards, which were done by PhDs and early carriers and also early carrier and from industries. So last year I was uh, judging such innovative solutions for different uh, categories. It, it is amazing to see what's happening and this allows you to link your research work in your lab to bring some more innovation from those ideas. And I have seen, by the way, from one of the winners of this innovation award uh, in 2019, they presented their award, the winning presentation, and they got a start of funding right away. So this tells that how being involved in these, even your students or yourself uh, as part of these, will allow you enormous amount of opportunities that you might not even think of. So again, the only reason I mention this is that there's always these smaller bits as well that you can add to your profiles that, will, that can chip in a lot of opportunities for yourself. So I think uh, in the interest of time, uh, I'll just uh, say that this is my pathway, what I, I think I've already mentioned as well, uh, from CISG perspective, uh, my expertise lie in channel modeling. We look at performance uh, analysis. Uh, my main uh, you know, uh, work uh, over the past decade has been around free space optical communication systems, looking at how laser beams and LEDs can be used, or those frequencies can be used for 
wireless communication perspective. And we're talking about uh, wavelengths of 750 nanometers, uh, 1550 nanometers, and so on. And the other bit that I started looking into last four or five years from my postdoc onwards was physical layer security. So as I said, I look at spectrum efficiency that is using higher frequencies for communications, and then also security efficiency, which is a primary thing that we move into our uh, wireless uh, technologies. So those two have been my primary goals. A lot of publications, uh, fortunately, have been there. And I have to thank all my collaborators, all my students, and uh, you know, one visiting postdoc for all this lovely work and supporting these ideas. Recently, over the last year, as I said, we are moving into the next generation. Uh, we are looking into, uh, this is a very initial project that I started looking into with one of my uh, postdoc collaborator uh, from, uh, in terms of reconfigurable intelligence services or also in other way known as intelligent reflective surfaces. We're trying to look into these surfaces, how we can maximize not only the rate, but also how we can secure our communications by using the, their different properties. Uh, but this is a stat, it's not a standalone solution, but it is basically a chip in to improve our systems. But more importantly, as we go non terrestrial, we want to explore what we can do with CubeSats. The future is there. OneWeb is, is launching hundreds of satellites. The Earth above us, that is the atmosphere around 200 kilometers above us, will be filled with satellites, hundreds of satellites all around the globe, providing seamless connectivity, hopefully. So we want to see how we can chip in, how we can bring our expertise from our research lab, from three space optical point of view, from security efficiency point of view, to that part. So we are doing that. And I have one new student, actually, I should not say new, but he's, he's in second year, who wanted to work with me, but he wanted to work in cyber resilience, although I don't have expertise in that, but he wants to. So I'm biding to whatever I can to my best, and he is trying his best. So that's also possible in academic careers that you can welcome. Uh, such students who want to do something which they are envisioning for their success and that's no harm in that so with that i thank you for all the patient hearing and bearing with me talking <laughs> so much but i hope that did justice to uh, myself and more importantly to all who were listening to me and this helps uh, all of us in our careers to at least some extent so that's me uh, my contact details are as well over here on this slide and uh, any final thoughts or comments are always welcome. I'll be happy to address them. But from my side, I have to wholeheartedly thank you all uh, for being over here and more importantly, the organizers uh, for having me uh, here with some value to share today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing all your details. And uh, participants, any more questions? Just one. So if there is no uh, question, yeah. Hey, sure. Yeah, just sure, one. Sir. Mr. Praveen. Yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, can we apply machine learning modeling in uh, wireless communication domain? Very good question, yes. So, yes, we can. Uh, I personally, I'm not a big fan of, again, I'm not demeaning, but I'm not a very big fan of machine learning. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, but I am uh, focusing on uh, having one student, uh, hopefully in, uh, next year, uh, who is willing to do machine learning in free space optical communications. He has prepared a proposal. So I am probably uh, trying to uh, increase my interest in that direction. But the quick answer is yes, it is possible. Uh, actually, it is a must when we look, go into identifying uh, different factors that play roles into uh, you know, reducing the, uh, or let's say increasing the outages or reducing our error rates and so on. So it's very important to identify those factors and then learn those to improve our systems in totality so yes yeah. it can yeah thank you and uh, this is for this may help in optimization uh, of, of our of our efforts that's definitely correct yes yeah so uh, can we explore further on this issue if i communicate with you sometime later definitely yes praveen more than welcome please yes if thank you. Will be, it, will be, it will be my pleasure no problem thank you So can we end up the session and for the lunch and like can we just continue the next session at two o'clock participants? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Imran. Thank you very much, sir. I'll just share your video uh, to your mail ID as, as soon as possible, sir. Perfect. No and the feedback Thank you from Thanks Thank for you. sharing everything. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks for spending your wonderful Bye -bye. time. Thank you.